Welcome to my podcast, The Relationship Chronicles. I'm so excited to be here with Shan Boudram, certified sexologist. (laughs) And so I have some really fun questions for you. I'm very excited. Good. I like excitement and sex in the same sentence. I was going to say, how often do we get to talk about sex? Me, all day, every day. You You know what? Maybe not so much. Bring me into your world today, okay? (laughs) Um, so first, before we start, I'm starting every episode with a this or that situation. So I'm going to say this or that. I'm going to read two things. You have to pick one. Okay. I'm okay with a little elaboration, but not much. I like this. Clear expectations. Okay. You're hitting my spot. Thanks. Okay. Here we go. So catching your parents in the act or your parents catching you and your husband in the act? Catch my parents in the act. 100%. <laughs> okay. Good. You didn't even have to think about that one. I've caught them before. <laughs> so and I have... acted very immaturely. And so I'd like a do-over. Okay. Okay. Practice, like you say, practice from your prior experiences. Okay. Slow burn or immediate attraction? Oh, definitely slow burn. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Long, slow, intentional burns. Okay. Love that. Um, New York dating scene or LA dating scene? I've never done New York dating scene before, so I think I should pick that one because I loved L.A., mastered L.A., had a mm-hmm. great time here. Mastered it. Yeah. I let me roll the dice over there. <laughs> see, see what you can come up with. Okay. Not anymore now, of course, obviously, because you're married with two beautiful little daughters. So. Yes, it's true. Okay. I'll still date in New York, though. <laughs> um, last one. One night stand or wait one year to have sex? One night stand. If it was one month, you'd get me. But a year, I think I that that would. It's a long time. It's a long time. They're too extreme. For where I'm at right now. Yeah. Time. Yeah. There was definitely times in my life where that would fit. Today, one night. One night. That's all you get. Okay, great. That was fun. We did it. Uh, great. Uh, segment okay, one. Okay, you have to answer those questions. Okay. Um, Just as fast, too. Okay. Um, catching my parents. Never happened before, but I'd rather that than the opposite um slow burn also and i i mean i'm i like new york also i feel like if i wasn't here i would be meant to be there so i'm gonna say new york dating scene also and i mean i guess one nice stand are we in love now nina we're the same you know similarity is what draws attraction i know but how I, okay but does it sound like i'm copying you since no I it doesn't it just sounds like great minds think alike i know and well cheers to that, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> <I love> that. <laughs> okay oh we're supposed to drink after cheers it's just water so it doesn't really count but you alcohol. know what? I'm not a drinker. And so, again, I'm making my husband sound like such a tyrant. But whenever they're <laughs> cheersing because I'm not drinking, he's like, get that water out of here because it's bad luck you to cheers. You can't even be a part of the cheers. Did you know that? I feel like you should. Do you know that? Is that a fact or did he just I've make that up? I've heard it before, but I think that you should still be a part of the cheers. Thanks. If you get a cute cocktail, like get a little maki, maki, maki tail. Okay, but it can't be water? It could be water. Put a lemon in it and we're going to call it a cocktail. Okay, good. I like this. This is great. Okay. I'm supportive. I'm always, I'm, I'm like, do what, do what makes you feel good. And everyone is included. So you would be invited in my cheers. Okay. Let's jump into this. Let's jump. What made you decide to pursue a career in sexology? I often get asked this question and I think about it like, let me ask you a verse. What did you want to do when you were really young? Before you even necessarily even knew what you wanted to do. Just something that you were always drawn to. Mm-hmm. Um, what did I want to do? Honestly, I felt like I wanted to be... I was really young. Wow, you put me on the spot. I kind of... Like, this is going to take me very deep. But when I was really young, I always just wanted to do what... Be really good at whatever I was doing. It didn't even really matter. So naturally, that created a lot of pressure and anxiety for me. (laughs) Um, But I was really good at being that person that everyone came to and a really good listening ear that included and, you know, giving sound advice and priding myself on not being overly biased or subjective. Um, So that led me to my current 
I'm career. so glad you answered that because some this could go very wrong, right? If I ask this question and you say like <laughs> I wanted to be an the, astronaut, that's the then first I'd thing. Then I'd be like stuck. Like, well, you didn't end up being that. So, <laughs> but I personally, because for me, I think of purpose not as a thing that you have to find. Mm-hmm. It's often something you have to rediscover mm-hmm. because we live in a world of so many social influences, and unless your natural talent was the piano or art or to be an astronaut, whatever it was that like your parents could understand, they don't necessarily support and scaffold and create a pathway for success for you. They would have to be familiar with whatever you were innately passionate about. Mm -hmm. So I was innately passionate about the human body. Mm -hmm. I was innately passionate about intimacy. And ain't no parent, no West Indian parent for sure, that's that's encouraging their kid. Yeah. (laughs) So it was the opposite. I was called, you know, lewd growing up a lot. I got in trouble a lot for my proclivities, which is a word I just learned. Like, you know, my Barbies were always naked. They were banned from being naked. And I went to a Catholic school and that's where we learned that masturbation is bad and even intimate hugs are bad. And going to the beach to see people in bathing suits can create impure thoughts. And so that natural desire that I had to explore my body, understand the body and see the beauty in the body was deeply discouraged. And so when I got older, that natural curiosity mixed with hormones, mixed with the understanding that this is awful and you're a bad person if you mm-hmm, engage with this, mm-hmm. led to me looking for a lot of very secretive places to indulge. Mm-hmm. And that led to lots of porn watching, lots of fiction book reading, lots of TV mm-hmm. and TV that was inappropriate for my age. And I would look at those things as copy and paste. This is what sex is. This is what pleasure is. This is what intimacy is. Wow. And spoiler alert, if uh, Sister Soldiers, The Coldest Winter Ever is your blueprint for how to have amazing sex, you're going to be fucked and not in the way that you're hoping for. <laughs> so <laughs> I had a really negative wow. teen sex life. And at the age of 19, I had seven sexual partners, no orgasms, never felt love before, despised myself, didn't understand my body, mm-hmm. felt like my body was broken. I thought, okay, one of two things are happening. Either My parents and all of the, you know, powers that be in my life were steering me in the right direction. This is a very negative place. Stay away from it. Or my interaction with it is very misguided. And so I took a bet on the ladder, got a library card and spent an entire summer reading sex ed books, textbooks and Kinsey Institute. And I found amazing information that was so boring. So I was like, okay, how do I make sex ed sexy? And that was the beginning of my career. And this started at age 19. 19. Yeah. Okay. So So I'm 21 now. Uh, (laughs) Now I'm 38. That's a long ass time ago. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what an an amazing story. And the fact that you decided at such a young age, you're going to take ownership and initiative to, to discover and learn without encouragement um, on your own. That's really wise for such a young person. Yeah, I don't know what it was. I often, I don't always always even take credit for that version of myself Mm -hmm. because I don't see it in me. I do see it in me in pieces, but for a very long time, I looked at that 19 year old version of myself and I thanked her. She went through so much judgment and criticism and on her path to education, it was not easy. Her Mm -hmm. parents were not proud, spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. And she went to, I was in school for journalism and journalism is right what you know. That's what I knew. Discouraged by all my teachers, you know, told that I couldn't go on certain work trips unless I changed my emails, like a bunch of stuff. And so I was so headstrong. Mm-hmm. I was like, what were you on? Like, mm-hmm. how did you do that? Mm-hmm. So I'm like very much in awe of her too. Okay. So tell me about your relationship now with your parents. How do they feel now you are this amazing, successful Certified sexologist, you've been on Today Show, Good Morning America, right? All the th- Netflix um, series, and you're okay, making research. I know, <laughs> I, I but I remember that all <gasps> on my own. So thank you. Um, now they look at you, and you're thriving and doing what you love. And so, how do they see your interests, and how do they? How's your relationship now with your mom or your parents regarding sex and? how open you are talking about it? I would give it like a 60. I think it ebbs and flows for sure. I think that they're definitely proud of the life that I've created. I think when my first book came out in 2009, they came to the book launch and my mom, when she first found out what I was doing and talking about sex, 
uh, the way that I did it is that I wrote my own story, my first sexual experience online. And I was looking for other people who were young, you know, in their late teens, early 20s to share their experiences too. And mm-hmm. as a way of vicariously learning from each other. Mm-hmm. And so I shared my story and I wanted to share it in the sister soldier way. And like, mm-hmm. I don't want it to be a cautionary tale. I want it to be interesting. I want you to fall in love with the characters. I want you to be a part of the heartbeat. You know, when wow. I first took my shirt off, I wanted it to be engaging. I wanted sex ed to be sexy. Mm-hmm. So my mom read it and she was like, boys are going to be laughing and masturbating and they're going to just be all around and they're going to be in danger and all her worst fears. And so when she came to this event and saw that nobody was laughing or masturbating, mm-hmm. she was like, okay, my daughter is safe mm-hmm. and this may not be that bad. But I do think that there is, of course, in the back of their mind, I would imagine that they hoped this would go away. I'm sure, you know what I mean? Like that there's a part of them. Mm-hmm, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I just talked, I had a, my latest podcast episode was about men who turn their partners down for sex. Like they don't have an interest in sex anymore in the relationship. In order to promote that, I'm like, okay, imagine you put on the sexiest lingerie and you go to your partner in the sexiest way. And I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to show it. So I'm going to put on my hot shit be crawling around on the ground. And I'm like, I'm sure my parents are like, I thought by two kids, this would be over. (laughs) When is this going to end? Right. Right. Um, So I think that they're definitely proud, but it is a very, I can empathize that it's not an easy, the thing that you probably dreamed that your kid would be when they grew up. Right. Like I said, you get to talk about sex every day and I'm just excited to have one conversation with it with you right now. (laughs) But I do want to say like, it's so important. How do your parents, are your parents really proud of you? I mean, Yeah. 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 They are. Um, I don't talk about sex for a living every day. Right. But um, I I think they, I don't know. I think they would be fine. My mom is very, I grew up in a household where we were just encouraged to be open. And it was, there was a lot of communicating happening in my home, which I'm so grateful for. And I feel like they've been pretty supportive. I feel like my dad, he's, he's, he, I would maybe have an issue with him, but as far as, you know, them being supportive of me, they're very supportive and they're so happy with anything that I do really. So it's yeah. good. And my mom is like fun and spunky and open. And so we, we talk about sex and there, there aren't a, a lot of things that are off limits, um, in our conversations, but I mean, I'm I'm happy to have had that experience, but I know so many people don't have that experience. Like you, I used to work in a high school um, and I worked with so many young girls and so much of our conversation was around sex and how they were um, interacting with the, the boys and how they weren't happy. And I feel like I spent majority of my time in sessions talking about how is this serving you? Like, is this something you enjoy? Are you happy? Do you feel like this person is like making you feel safe? And majority of the time the answer was no. Um, I think a lot of young people have these ideas around sex where they get them from wherever else. And if we don't talk to them about it and, and, share a little bit more and have and create the space to have those open conversations they don't know what to do with it and so I was able to do that with them obviously as their as their therapist but as in terms of how they were handling things at home it wasn't quite the same so oh for sure yeah right. that's what you had and I think my parents tried to create that in their own way my parents had an open door policy where it's like you can ask anything mm-hmm. you can bring it up sometimes if I did ask it would end in tears for my mom or make mm-hmm. her, you know, so then you kind of mm-hmm. quickly learn like these conversations make my mom uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but moreover, putting the burden of responsibility on a young person to initiate conversations that you find hard mm-hmm. may not necessarily be the best approach either. Right. So with that being said, like how do you, or will you approach those types of conversations with your kids? Yeah. My two-year-old knew the word vulva same time she learned the word knees or toes. It's mm-hmm. part of your body. So like mm-hmm. it's age appropriate, dynamically building conversations around sexuality period. Mm-hmm. It's around intimacy period. So as you get older, you learn about, you know, good touch, bad touch. You learn agency over your body. You learn appropriate touch for your body. Like right. all of those things. Cause she's two. So as she gets three and four and 
you know, start school to a social interaction where kids are playing house. And we know from our lived experience that sex is an integrated part of your life. Right. And I, when I went to school for sexology, it was actually really freeing because we had a particular course that was like age by age, normal sexual behavior. And normal is just a word to say like within the range, uh, the median, mm -hmm. here's what people mm -hmm. are doing at certain ages. Mm -hmm. And it does start from age two. Oh, it absolutely. It starts from utero, right? Yeah. And when we think about the language that we use societally around we want to keep their purity. We want to keep their innocence. It's mm -hmm. like we were born uninnocent. So why are you associating sex with the loss of innocence? Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be innocent means to be not guilty of doing any harm or wrong. And why right. is it harm or wrong if you are touching your own body and delighting in the pleasures and the gifts of your own body? So learning about that was really helpful because I know masturbation or playing starts a lot younger than many people assume that it would. Mm -hmm, and so I think mm -hmm. those age appropriate conversations that they build dynamically as they grow are really important in how I want to parent. Right. I feel like it's so interesting watching children. Obviously we know using the proper terminology to describe their genitals and whatever the case may be. But I remember uh, several conversations with different people about how their little four-year-old boys or whomever like standing on the countertop like naked looking in the mirror bending over backwards like all of these things trying to figure out what the heck is happening here yeah <laughs> so i mean it starts at a really young age and i agree with you i was thinking of a so story of a friend who told me that their son was like humping laundry baskets and then he always <laughs> just be like my birdie is tingling my birdie is tingling oh so. my god <laughs> My birdie is tingling. Okay, so wait, where did he get that term? I guess that was the play term. Like my term growing up for my Volvo was my Ludi Lou. So <laughs> I hope we're part of the generation now that's just like, you got a dick. <laughs> that's what's going on. Okay. Um, that's good. We we use the word penis in our house. So Yeah, that's probably that's good enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um Tell me about, I'm shifting gears a little bit, even though this is really funny. <laughs> Tell me about how you met your husband. Yes, we met, do you know the comedian Atheon Crockett, by chance? And I'm just, okay, I'm going to go back before you even we even talk about Atheon Crockett. Okay. <laughs> you telling me how your husband is like, da-da-da-da-da, like, on point, and like, rules this, that, and the other, and like, he marries you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I would. I can't wait. Let me. Let it's me. Interesting. Let's interesting. He's. Go. I mean, we work. Me and my husband work together. Mm -hmm. So people sometimes ask about like how you not get sick of each other. Mm -hmm. Literally, the dad version of him, the husband version of him, the work version of him are very different people. We know that about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Who we are at work is very different from who we bring home. So I feel like there's multiple facets of his personality. His work personality is very strict. Doesn't like to be bothered. He's very organized. And then even in real life, though, he's a rule follower. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was complimentary for me because I'm not a rule follower at all. Mm -hmm. And he's mm -hmm. very mindful of other people's experiences. I can be such a rebellious person to the discomfort of others. And he's hyper conscious of everyone else's experiences. Wow. So that was actually positive to like a small example is, you know, I've told the story online and I got in trouble for it, which is just it's a fact of life. There are some people <laughs> who go to Target and Walmart. And they open the box to see the product. I'm that person. Oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> I want to be like, I'm opening the box. And if I don't like it, I'm closing the box and go by my business. Oh, you're going to put it back. I'm going to put it back if okay. I don't like okay. it. You okay. know what I mean? And I'm sometimes not going to put it back properly. It's going to be like, okay, that's it. I'm going to walk away. Okay. Because I just perceive. So how did you get in trouble? Because I shared, shared this and people like, you're a shitty human being. <gasps> you died. <laughs> you know? Okay. 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 So that is, that's that. You're going to go look at a towel at Target, be like, oh, this is the wrong size, and then just kind of put it back and walk away. Yeah. He is not that person. So we went to Target once, and I opened a box, and I was like, glad I opened it. Not what I would want it. Not what I would expect it. Totally wrong. Put it back. And he was okay. like, you need to put this back properly. And I was mm. like, somebody works here. They're going to do it. Move on. Like, let's just go. Mm. We're in a rush. And so he, we get to the checkout counter, and then I'm like, he's like, I got to run and get something. So I'm waiting for him. Now I got to let people butt in front of me because he's taking so long. <laughs> I can't find it. I call him. He's not answering. So I'm like, where is this guy? So I'm not walking in the store looking for him. 
I find him back in the section where that box <gasps> was done and he was putting it back together properly. Oh my god! And so I'm like, that's very yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the difference in our personalities. And we know in the work that we do that people use the adage opposites attract. It's actually incorrect. The more the same you are to somebody, the more likely you are to have long-term intimate success. Mm-hmm. But self-expansion is also a huge reason why humans in particular get into relationships. So beyond just needing to procreate, beyond just the desire to have safety and shelter and companionship, we also desire to expand, mm-hmm. to do things we've never done before, to achieve more, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what makes humans unique, which is why you know, when dogs have free time, they're like, there's a patch of sun, I'll take a nap. Mm-hmm. When humans have free time, we're like, let's build a cannon. Right. How do we make a box that you can launch rockets from. So right. that's our difference. So he was an opportunity for expansion for me. He was an opportunity for achievement, for growth. And I knew that really early on that we were different, but in the ways that he was different from me, I wanted to be the same. And um that's beautiful. Yeah. How how long because that could also be really tricky when you're very opposite, right? So there's a, a learning curve, right? where you have to experience things and practice new behaviors and learn from your spouse or your partner. How long did it take you guys to find a healthy, like comfy, cozy trade-off or balance between the two opposite personalities? Yeah, I would say where we were really different, we wanted what the other person had. And Mm -hmm. that's really important. And so my husband would self-identify as not being very intelligent when we first met. So Mm. that was, he didn't learn a lot in school. He's, you know, a good looking guy who played on the football team, did music. He was never really held accountable to learn. And so Mm -hmm. disidentified as not really being that and loved that in me that I knew a lot of words and Mm -hmm. loved to read. And he wanted that. So Mm -hmm. some people would meet us and be like, my my parents were like, this dude's too dumb. Um, But (laughs) he was, my parents judgmental. It's all good. So am I. (laughs) I, uh, no, I mean, I totally understand what you're, people want you to be, your people want you to be with someone they feel is, that you're compatible with, yes, right? like you're equal. Exactly. And there were areas that you're like, this woman is not as nice as you. This man is not as smart as you. But mm-hmm. like, I want what you have and you want what I have. And that's why it worked. I think if we were opposites who didn't understand or didn't want to move towards a place of sameness in those areas, then it wouldn't have worked. But right. ultimately we have really similar values. Like it lined up in like such a beautiful way. And my hu- husband and myself were fuck buddies to start. Mm-hmm. And it was an amazing fuck buddy relationship, which I almost hate that we got married because it was so good <laughs> that it, I could have written books about it. It was so <laughs> healthy, so communicative, so boundaried. So mindful of the fact that it wasn't going to progress. Mm-hmm. And we were really clear about that. So it was great. And um, one of the things early on that we started to kind of realize is that through our shared, through that being so good, it was a possibility for other dynamics to also work as well. Okay. Well, there's a huge question. Some people can't don't believe that you can go from friends with benefits to full-blown in a relationship in a healthy way. So obviously you are debunking that myth. Yes. How how did you guys gracefully or successfully make that type of transition? I think one of my favorite quotes about intimacy building is healthy intimacy is moving one step at a time, but not moving towards something, just moving. Mm -hmm. You can also move back, Mm -hmm. move to the left, move Mm -hmm. to the right. And you take a step, check in with each other. You cool here? Do you like this? Can you meet this need? Can you meet this step, the mm-hmm. requirements to be here? If you can't, let's go back. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. let's chill here for a while. I think it's what we did. Started out as fuck buddies. There was working fine. And then he was like, hey, I'm having a party. Some people are coming over to watch football. Do you want to come? And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> social interaction. It's like, <laughs> how do I feel? I go, mm-hmm. this is comfortable. Okay, you know what? I'm going to go to a dinner. Do you want to come with me? I need a plus one. You come. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we're friends now. Mm -hmm. So let's stay here for a while. Let's be friends. Oh, I'm going away for a week. Need someone to water my plants. Can you do that? Yeah, I can. I give you my keys. Come back. My shit's not dead. Okay. Or gone. Or gone. (laughs) Or gone. That's pretty trustworthy. So you're trustworthy. Yeah, you're trustworthy. Okay. And it was just like that. Literally one step at a time until... 
He got a certain point where he called me. We're friends with benefits. We're friends now at this point. He's venting. His roommate is moving his girlfriend in. It's going to be hard. He has to find somewhere else Mm -hmm. to live. And it just flows out of me like water. Just come stay with me until you find something else. Mm -hmm. He's like, no. So, okay, I put it out there. Called me back, said, I just said no immediately because I like what we have. I don't really want to complicate things. We we have such a great time together, but I actually could really use the help. And Mm -hmm. if you're clear that it's just three weeks until I find something else, I think we can try to manage this. Great. We do those three weeks. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I love living with this person. And he finds somewhere to go. And I'm like, do you really want to leave? Because I... (laughs) Love living with you. Uh huh. And then he moves in, and we're like, now we need to find a label for this. And because we were still seeing other people, open relationship just fit perfectly because we wanted a label to describe to people that we obviously live together and we're romantic, mm-hmm. but we don't do so under the traditional confinements of what monogamy looks like. And that was 2016, and just literally kept happening just like that. Wow. It's interesting because how do you feel about intentioned dating? Intentioned dating. I mean, dating is so different. I, it's really interesting because I never was on the dating scene. So all of my experiences are learned through other people. Um, I met my husband in college. I met him in high school. And by the time I got to college, we were together, essentially. Um, and so I feel like today, my personal opinion is that you date with intentions. I don't know that it's doable because everybody has such a different idea of what dating looks like. Their modern dating to me is like not something that I would have survived in um, if I were dating with my my little mindset way back when. Um, and so I feel like being open and it depends on what you want. Like I have friends that are dating that are like looking for, um, to settle down and, and they're open and ready to like accept that love into their lives. And if they find the right person, then they would. And I have friends that are dating that are like, eh, like if, unless they, everything aligns perfectly and the stars and the moons and the, the love and the everything, then they're like, I can go without. I was just on to the next, swipe to the next, left, right, whatever. So I feel like it kind of just depends. But I feel like being open and honest and putting yourself out there when you're dating is important because you don't have to waste time. Either they take it or they leave it or you take it or you leave it. And you can just move on to the next person until you find the person you feel you're most compatible with in that way. Yeah. And I I always have this conversation with people because I think it's an interesting approach Mm -hmm. because you can start the first date because at the time that I met my husband I definitely I was like 30 Mm -hmm. I definitely was looking Mm -hmm. for a long-term part I was looking for I was I always wanted to get married and Mm -hmm. I wanted that and I met him and I'm like it's not you you're too dumb Uh, (laughs) he's very smart (laughs) so hot and I know so okay so when you say this and he's like behind the camera like what is his response I mean this is like 10 years ago now (laughs) so you know close to I met him 2015 so so while eight years ago um so I think that now we can something we can laugh at I'm sure that he had impressions he did not see me he actually started a relationship with me because I was a sex expert and he's like oh I can use her to learn about to be better with other women Oh. And, like, that was his approach to it. Okay. So, like, he was looking to gain and I was looking to gain. And we didn't <laughs> see each other as anything else, which is okay. why I say it was a very healthy relationship for what Slow it was burn. in the beginning. Because, yeah, genuinely neither person was, like, kind of hoping you surprise me and become my husband. Mm-hmm, like, it mm-hmm. was, like, you're uh, enough at what you can provide. And I don't want anything more. Right. It was really positive in that way. The transaction was very healthy. But, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely in the beginning, we would never be together. If I was only considering my husband, mm. I was just more on, and a friend of mine, Hey Friend Hey says in life, people focus a lot on the to-do list rather than to, to feel list, mm-hmm. to do, want to get married, want to have a long-term relationship, want to have kids. And so if I go on a date with you, my to-do list is top of mind. Even if I feel light, sexy, mm-hmm. fun, relaxed mm-hmm. with you. You're not going to hit my list, so I'm going to disregard you. Right. And then how many relationships, even if they don't end up blossoming into the real thing, but how many positive, mutual, reciprocal, healthy dynamics are we shucking to the side because 
they don't fit in line with our goal. That's not even going to be a reality for another two years minimum. Right. A lot. So with that said, what is your thought on dating with intention? I think it's important, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think that dating with directiveness is important that like you mm -hmm. have to have a long-term vision in mind, but I do think you can look at yourself like a company when you're the CEO of this multi-billion dollar company and there's lots of different roles. Right. So I think you should identify those different roles. I'm looking for a long-term, I'm looking for a CEO. That's not right. a hard job to fill. I'm looking for a co-founder. <laughs> but I also wouldn't mind a custodian to clean the pipes every once in a while. Okay. I wouldn't mind an intern to grab me some coffee to do, you know, go on cool dates with. So right. I think if you can expand it in that way, you can find more successful interactions and enjoy dating more. And mm -hmm. when I say that I mastered the dating scene in LA, that's really what I did. Mm -hmm. I had so many incredible people in my life that maybe weren't any of them weren't like my vision of my all, but mm -hmm. they all fulfilled particularly roles very successfully. And that was good enough for me. Right. And what I was offering in return was good enough for them. Okay, so with that being said, because I feel like as people, there's not one person. I feel like everyone puts a lot of pressure on their partner, their spouse, whatever, to fulfill all the things for them. And so I personally don't believe that any one person can give you everything that you need, right? And so how did you get to a place where you're like, you're building a company and you're like, you need a janitor, you yes. need a CEO, you need a co-founder, like, did you feel, do you feel like you got all of that in your husband? No, no, for sure not. And I probably don't to this day. He's the best I'm going to get, hands down. And right. I really mean that. I don't mean that. It sounds negative. Like, it's the best no. I can do. <laughs> no, it's the 80-20, um, the movie, 80-20. Jill Scott says it in, in a movie. Like, you're going to get 80% yes. of what you imagine what you need what you want in a relationship and the other 20 percent is you know go go figure it out elsewhere essentially yes um but obviously within the bounds of the rules and your of, of your relationship but yeah i get what you're what you're saying it's it's not always the grass is not greener right always and um, it's yeah. also acknowledging too that the things ebb and flow like we really bonded in the beginning on our joy for just the whys of life, a very philosophical approach to thinking about life. And when our brains would wander, we would both wander to, why is the sky blue? How many planets are there? How what is the sun? Like, right. what is life? What right. is God? And we spend a lot of time talking about that. I'm in that place again right now. Right. You know, I had two kids. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, I have everything that I want in life and I'm still feeling anxious sometimes. So I'm like, what is that? Nothing mm -hmm. in my environment has to change. My environment, my relationships are amazing. So I'm trying to like figure out my feelings and right. my partner is on a project right now and he's very work focused. So whenever his mind has time to wander, it's on like logistics and very practical things where my right. mind is like woo woo stuff. Mm -hmm. So I remember one day after like recently I was like downloading on him about planets and like how many galaxies there are. And he was like, are you going through something? <laughs> <laughs> and he was just like kind of disregarded me. And then, you know, I was upset. Because I felt like I'm letting you in on my inner thoughts. Like uh -huh. you should be taking them in. But it's not where his brain is at. And so after that, I called my sister. I'm like, can we set up a weekly hike? Because here's where my brain wants to go. And she's like, you know what? I'm actually trying to get into like the neuroscience of things right now because she's an executive coach. And I'm like, great. That's my person to do this with. I don't uh -huh. have to force my husband to care about astronomy and uh -huh. like the uh -huh. brain function if right now his thoughts are elsewhere. So I think that there were times that we line up in that way and and elsewise, but we're definitely fluid in that way where, yep. and we're still open um, sexually and romantically. Nobody engages just because of time factors. We have two small kids, but I think if we came to a place, you know, um, intimately where there were those gaps, we would also be comfortable with that. Okay, good. I feel like that kind of takes me into a good segue how has like your sex life changed since having kids? What is, what does it, is it any different? How many kids do you have? You have I kids? I have three. Three. I, yeah. Two? I say it sounding so tired. When three? I say it, <laughs> when I meet people who have three parents, I'm like, oh, you love this shit. Well, the well, first I have one? twins. Oh, okay. My second, my second bunch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they came at the same time. Oh, wow. So. We were at the park yesterday we, with somebody who had one and then twins. Yeah. It kind of like catches you but it's i mean everything has their it's it's benefits and 
you know, pros and cons. I feel like my kids are very close in age. So my son, pre-pandemic, I used to take him out all the time. We would go everywhere. He would fly with me. It was very simple, just having one kid. And then my girls came along, and I could never take them anywhere with me while they were babies. It was just too unpredictable. I like to kind of know. I'm more like your husband. If we were a couple, I would be your husband, and you would be mine. Well, I um, love my husband, so this relationship's already working out. I told you. <laughs> we're like, we have so much in common. Yeah, it's. I have two girls, and it was my. it's my best case scenario, so I'm really... Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, that's so good for you. Well, I definitely, interestingly, like, I really wanted a boy to begin, mm-hmm. and my husband really wanted a girl. I mean, we had conversations about that. It's because we both idolized the experience of the opposite. Mm. So he thought life was easier as a woman, and I'm like, are you uh-huh. crazy? <laughs> Because I, mean, I think just going through and seeing the struggle that his he has had and his brothers have had and many of his friends have had to like find their place in the world and mm-hmm. just the way that the world is set up now, women do thrive in the workplace more. Our skill sets that are uh, natural, I want to say, but also that are supported and encouraged mm-hmm, fit mm-hmm. better with a more cooperative world and a less brute workforce world. So a lot right. of, you know, especially a lot of black men grow up being encouraged to be very athletic, being encouraged to be, you know, very aggressive, to be encouraged, to not be very sensitive. And then that works until you turn 19 years old and you're out of high school. And now if you didn't get that scholarship, you didn't get to advance in that world. 90% of our our, our young people. Yes. I made that number up, but my point is it's, it's most young people, especially young black males. There are so many people who play sports when they're young and, they want to continue on, but only a few do. And so having those skills and trying to figure out what your identity is after sports is obviously something that I'm very knowledgeable about through my own experience and then watching so many of my friends and family and my husband and all of that um, kind of navigate their own experiences. So that's a really good... Yeah, it's hard. It's tough. And not everybody figures it out. Very few do. And... Yeah, especially again, like this, the school system fails them too because they don't encourage them to develop other skills. They don't actually encourage them to learn. Like he said, like he, I can't even imagine that. He's like, I didn't learn anything in high school. Yep. What? Like that's crazy. Mm-hmm. So, so I okay, ran. so I know back to <laughs> sex life after your two girls. Yes. Tell us how old they are. First of all, I wanna, one I is one nine is... months and one is two and a half. <gasps> you have a baby. Yes, I got a baby. Oh, you're so lucky. And my baby girl, I got the birth control and the baby maker. So the birth control is the first one. If she came and y'all didn't have kids, you'd be like, maybe I don't need kids. And in a good way. <laughs> Wait, which one is she? The first born. Oh, nuts. <laughs> wild always dirty face always dirt everywhere dirt under her fingernails like she's called baby tarzan like (laughs) my dad calls her feral you know she's a wild baby and requires a lot and kind of what you said like we didn't go to restaurants when she was small you can't do a lot she's very emotional so takes needs a lot of energy so unless we're going to a park or some kind of zoo where she can run wild with her chimpanzee friends there's nothing for her and you were civilized (laughs) But the nine-month-old is the baby maker. I'd bring her in here and everybody would be like, we need one of those. How do I get one of these? (laughs) Like, day and night experience. It's always interesting because I always look at her. I'm like, I wonder if you were first, you know? I I feel like it's it typically does happen that way. I feel like the first is always like the simple one. And that's how we get tricked into having more. But that's really interesting. It was reverse for you. No, we definitely, the second one was a surprise pregnancy. And I don't even know because we were so overwhelmed. I don't think we would have like, we were thinking about it. But nonetheless, this is a long story short. Mm -hmm. I asked you about how many kids you have because the answer to the sex thing, I think, is different depending on the kid. After kid one, it was a struggle for us because it was going from zero to one is really hard. Mm -hmm. Navigating who am I, your identity, your time. Mm -hmm. There's so much at play. And disparity among who's doing more, who's doing less, the building up of resentment. And then also acknowledging that you get into a management position with each other. We work together too. So we're managing each other in work. And then after work hours, we're still like, get the wipes, get the this. Mm -hmm. Can you rock her? Is there milk warming? Can you try to breastfeed her? Can you do this? And we're talking to each other like that, right? Right. Like like machines. Right. And then you lay down at night and I'm supposed to be turned on by you. (laughs) 
The supervisor? The mean ass supervisor? <laughs> I don't want to fuck my boss, my mean boss. Time manager. Yeah. yeah. You know, and he doesn't want it. So I think it was like that. And we just had a hard time finding our way. After the second, though, amazing. I think we just got into our flow more mm-hmm. and we le- leaned on each other. We had that inner smile a lot. Mm-hmm. We're doing crazy stuff. Then we look at each other and we're like, you know, it's that we're thinking the same thing. This shit is crazy. <laughs> but we're still in it. And that turns me on that you're still here with me. Mm-hmm. And by the way, your ass looks great right now. Mm-hmm. Also, pass me the wipes. Mm-hmm. And so that, I think, just kind of became more of it. We just got more into our flow. So I think we're at a really great place now. But it, it took a lot of navigating. So whenever people do that, sometimes people put that off until the second kid or the third. Mm-hmm. or it, it all just changes. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's really good and interesting. Thanks for sharing life? that. I feel like um, more people should talk about it. Um, my sex life is good. It's it's like, it's fine. I, I don't have any, <laughs> it's probably not as exciting as yours. I will say that hands down, but it's really exciting for me yes. and it's great. Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know how it changed after having kids. I think we're just more busy. I can relate a lot to the whole scheduling thing. We were at dinner actually last night, my husband and I, and talking about he wanted to talk to me about something. I was like, honest, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Like, I just want to enjoy. Like, I don't want to talk about the kids. I don't want to talk about a schedule. Like, let's talk about something silly. Um, and so there's a lot of that that happens between us. And I feel like it that takes a little bit of time to build up. But as far as um my sex life is great. I don't have any problem. We and it's. I'm very lucky because we. I think. I feel like we align in our every like our our needs. You know our. Yes. You know everything kind of aligns to where there aren't many challenges. So it's good. That's I don't think great. it changed at, from high. Okay. I just something just clicked for me. I now understand why everything feels so normal. We met when we were. Or 18? I was 19? We were both 19 when we met. So our sex life then was very different than what it looks like now. Yes. I mean, I feel like we've settled more into like a regular, normal, humanly possible groove than when we were like 19. But yeah. it's been it's been kind of steady. So 19 was fast, furious, and constant. We went to college together. We were in school together. Yeah, it was mm. kind of, there was there was less to worry about, think about. We weren't so busy and now there's just a lot of scheduling, a lot of kid stuff. And, you know, he, half the time he's not even home. So it, I think there's a little, it's, we know I can kind of sense it's like a sixth sense, like when I can feel like him, like energy coming my way and I'm like, okay, it's time. But aside from that, it's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's amazing. I mean, I think I definitely have a sex life that's less exciting than people would assume based on my title. Um, But I have great sex and I enjoy it. Kind of like what you said. Like, maybe it's not your great, but it's my great. Yeah. I was talking recently with somebody who we were talking about something when it came to like gratitude for your partner or like, well, how do you keep the spice going? That typical question. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the fire hot? And um, I was answering it. And then afterwards I asked the question back and they were like, it's not hot at all. It's oh. really cold. It's okay. actually a very challenging time because it's not. Uh, and I was like, well, that's a time to lean into gratitude. Yeah. Like, thank you. You know how many times I look at my husband in the eye and genuinely say, thank you for not going to the store for milk and never coming home. Because I would totally get it. This mm-hmm. life is crazy. Mm-hmm. These kids are fucking crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how much you have to put yourself to the back burner? Like, even right now, like, he's sick, like, really sick. And... You can't be sick because you have so many responsibilities. Like mm-hmm. even that people don't realize with parenting. Like not only are you not putting yourself first, but you're putting yourself down. Mm-hmm. You are mm-hmm. actively in process of killing yourself, oh. not sleeping, not healing, not nourishing yourself. And you haven't gone to the store for some cigarettes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. That's hot. Mm-hmm. Do I want to have sex with you? Absolutely not. Too mm-hmm. tired. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you're in this with me. Like, that's cool. Right. Like, and we should normalize that as being a passionate period of time. Totally. I was going to say exactly that. I feel like that's such a normal space to be in because like anything else, people's sexual lives ebb and flow in relationships. 
things change. You, you add in kids to the mix, um, career pressures, whenever something is going on that's really significant at work. And there's probably a little bit less of a sexy, fiery time happening at home. Um, it just depends on where the focus is. But there's always a way to get back to it. And like you said, like coming from a place of gratitude is a good example of that. So Yeah. Okay. I feel like we've been like all around the world and back. And I feel that this has been such an informative conversation for me, I'm sure for all of the listeners. And I just want to say or ask you, what do you feel is, are the most important takeaways for people to know and understand about sex, about their sex life, or even talking about sex with their children, which I think was a huge focus about our conversation today? I think talking about sex, period. Um, give what you want to get. So if you want honesty and vulnerability, you got to give that. Mm. If you were talking to your partner and you want it to be a conversation that they get excited about, you be excited mm -hmm. and make it exciting. So give what you want to get, right? And um, yeah, be willing to have these dialogues and then there to be an immediate change afterwards. Like, mm -hmm. so that becomes like a reward system for them. Like, wow, we had that hard talk and then that positively impacted whatever we did next. And that can be with your kids too. So right. you have to make the conversation enjoyable. And that as obviously when you're a parent to child relationship, the burden of responsibility is on you to do that. But when you're in a relationship, you want your partner to also be incentivized to do the same for you. They got to make it enjoyable for you. It's got to be mutual. It's got to be fun for you. You have mm -hmm. to see the benefits of going there, going well. And mm -hmm. going there is not like, you know, we know this in the work that we do, and especially in the work that you do as a therapist, that people glamorize vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want you to be honest with me. Mm -hmm. And like, what if my honesty is some weird shit? Right. What if my honesty makes you uncomfortable? What if my honesty challenges you to now do something with that information that you're not even prepared to be cool about? Absolutely. But that's why creating a space where people feel so comfortable, uh, comfortable enough coming to you, whether it be your kids, your spouse or whatever, having open, intentional conversations about sex and vulnerability is contagious. Like you said, it's so important to be vulnerable, but oh, approaching everything with an open mind is, is definitely going to be key to having these successful conversations about sex and family and all of the above. Okay. Before we get out of here though, you have a book called yes. The Game of Desire yes, and a podcast called Lovers and Friends, which I heard and learned about from a really good friend of mine. She's like, you have to listen to this podcast. So you have some really excited listeners out Yay. there. Tell us a little bit about like, where can we get your book and where can we listen? Yeah, the book is available everywhere that books are. And as we talked about dating today, almost everything that I referenced, like even the job listing thing, I have an activity in the book that's called the job posting, where you can get clear about the roles and the um, boundaries, confinements, and requirements of each. So that's a lot of what we talked about, Speak to the Game of Desire. And Lovers and Friends is a podcast where we're topic-focused, go into relationship, dealing with sex, love, and relationships. I try to go there. Um, I try to take people with me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's it. So thank you for having me today, though. Of course. Thank you for coming. It was great to see you. Meet okay. you. We should be cheers at the end. Cheers. I we have nowhere with else to go. With our water and hey. all. Cheers with water. <laughs>